you will stand, let's turn over to Leviticus 13. Leviticus 13, told Brother Roger. Long chapter, short message. Long chapter, short message. Maybe, probably, hopefully. And uh, unless, I, unless I have a laughing fit up here, but I don't think that's going to happen. Um, Leviticus 13. I'm not going to read the entire chapter. We will be likely referencing some... Some of you know what that means when I said that laughing fit. Um, we're not going to be reading the entire chapter. We will be likely referencing some of these things as we get into the cleansing of the leper next week. Um, so what I'd like to do is I'm going to read some scripture, kind of give you a summary of what's going on. And then if you'd like, certainly go back in your private study and reading and read through the course of the chapter. Leviticus 13, let's read first of all verses 1 through 8. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, saying... When a man shall have in the skin of his flesh a rising, a scab, or bright spot, and it be in the skin of his flesh like the plague of leprosy, then he shall be brought unto Aaron the priest, or unto one of his sons the priests. And the priest shall look on the plague of the skin of the flesh, and when the hair in the plague is turned white, and the plague in sight be deeper than the skin of the flesh, it is a plague of leprosy, and the priest shall look on him and pronounce him unclean. If the bright spot be white in the skin of his flesh, and in sight be not deeper than the skin, and the hair thereof be not turned white. Then the priest shall shut up him that hath the plague seven days, and the priest shall look on him the seventh day. And behold, if the plague in his sight be at a stay, and the plague spread not in the skin, then the priest shall shut him up seven days more. And the priest shall look on him again the seventh day. And behold, if the plague be somewhat dark, and the plague spread not in the skin, the priest shall pronounce him clean. It is but a scab, and he shall wash his clothes and be clean. But if the scab spread much abroad in the skin, after that he hath been seen of the priest for his cleansing, he shall be seen of the priest again. And if the priest see that, behold, the scab spreadeth in the skin, then the priest shall pronounce him unclean. It is a leprosy. Look over at verse number 43. Verse 43, of course, throughout the course of Scripture, he's given some more symptoms here, but I wanted to just kind of single this portion out. Verse number 43, Then the priest shall look upon it, and behold, if the rising of the sore be white reddish in his bald head, or in his bald forehead, as the leprosy appeareth in the skin of the flesh, he is a leprous man, he is unclean. The priest shall pronounce him utterly unclean, his plague is in his head. And the leper in whom the plague is, his clothes shall be rent, and his head bare, and he shall shall put a covering upon his upper lip, and shall cry, Unclean, unclean. All the days wherein the plague shall be in him, he shall be defiled, he is unclean. He shall dwell alone, without the camp shall his habitation be. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, as we delve into this subject of such a serious matter, may we be reverently aware, Lord, that by your grace... <coughs> There is hope in such a disparaging, desolate condition. And so, Father, we look at this, and, and no doubt we will be moved as the Spirit deems fit. No doubt, Father, as I read this and considered those who were afflicted by this dreaded disease, that my heart was moved in compassion, but also in, 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 in great humility for what you've done for us in order to spare us. And Father, I pray that you would send your Spirit upon us. May you make your presence known unto us. May we all be humbled before you, ready with great expectation to receive your word today. And Father, for your spirit to make holy application in our individual lives. May you be glorified and honored in all things that we say and all things that we do. Father, in the prayers that are prayed, even in the silent prayers of the hearts in attendance, Father, may we bring you honor and glory with confessed sin, seeking uh, humbly re re repentance and forgiveness. Father, I ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. The title of my message this morning is Isolation, Condemnation, Alienation, Desolation. Isolation, Condemnation, Alienation, Desolation. Now, after having already listed a small series of contrasts between the holy and the unholy, Leviticus 13 continues the division that God is placing between that which is clean and that which is unclean. 
So we know that the principal lesson, again, the introduction to our series in Leviticus articulated this. We've made mention of it from time to time throughout the course of the study, and we so shall make mention of it throughout the course of the study, that the theme, the principle to be learned from the book of Leviticus is holy living, a holy life in fellowship with God. And particularly in chapters 11 through 15, there are detailed laws that show just how God's people are to live in this sin-cursed world around them. When contemplating God's instruction to His people concerning the clean and the unclean, immediately the New Testament words of Paul come to mind when he says there in 1 Corinthians six seventeen, Wherefore come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. That's why these studies through Leviticus, we've been able to see the New Testament application. And we really, it brings the New Testament to life when you read Paul saying, Touch not the unclean thing, but be separate. And then we see what he's writing referencing here. And so this New Testament principle, this principle of holiness, while ceremonial law may be abrogated, the principle of holiness is not. It is certainly in full effect. And uh, God still desires to have a sanctified people unto Himself because God is still Himself holy. And so holiness is a subject that really we ought to spend a great deal of time discussing. To review, Leviticus 11 revealed God's determination of those external things that were unclean for the Israelites in order for them to avert any contact with them or to avoid them, thereby providing God's people a knowledge to discern that which was sinful and that which was not. This speaks of the importance of identifying sin and obeying God and avoiding it when it comes into our presence. When the temptation arises, know, be able to discern between that which is clean and that which is unclean externally. In fact, this is one of the duties of the priest to make a difference between the clean and the unclean. And remember, we're not just speaking of preachers here. I'm not your priest. <laughs> you are a priest. You are a royal priesthood, a chosen generation with one great high priest, Jesus Christ. I'm not your priest. I'm simply your pastor. And so it is up to all of us, as God gives us lists, as God gives us law, it's up to all of us to discern between right and between wrong. Leviticus 12 dealt with the laws concerning childbirth. We dealt with that last Last week, and what that did was reveal the innate uncleanness of the human race, and it was a call to remember from whence we fell in the first place. That example is given for instruction in recognizing the inherent nature of sin in all men, that all men are born sinners. There's sin all around us. There's uncleanness all around us. Leviticus 11 shows us that. Leviticus 12 shows us that there's uncleanness within us. That we are born into sin. In, in sin did my mother conceive me. The child comes forth from the womb speaking what? Lies, David says. Now, now we have in Leviticus 13 a harrowing account of the destructive and the painful results of sin. So therefore it is of grave importance that we all take note of this grotesque picture that we are examining and draw the parallel of what sin is and what sin does to the individual. Now again, for such a long chapter, I, I think we have more of a brief message. As detailed as the chapter is concerning the putting away of the infected individual and the end result of his case, there's really just one pointed message that needs to be made and really honestly doesn't really lend itself to exhaustive exposition. What we have in view is a dreaded disease that prevented the individual who was affected from tabernacle worship and communal fellowship with God's people. And the picture is, is clear, and the principle is not to be mistaken this morning. So we're going to look at selected portions of our text, and I pray draw a pointed and powerful conclusion from it. So let's look first of all at the facts to consider, and then we'll look at the application thereof, okay? So before we get into the personal application and what is presented in the Word of God from a spiritual angle, we need to examine the facts from a literal, historical, and really even a medical context. So we begin by understanding what leprosy is. I'm going to say some things. I'm not going to do it in order to gross you out. It's good that we're not having the first. In fact, for some of us, it may curb that appetite we have, may get you to think about something else other than food for a while, and you'll think about uh, the message this morning, okay? And so I'm not doing this in order to just shock you. The reason I'm stating these things
things is because it's the reality of what is being presented. Now, aside from the description in our chapter, and our chapter actually gives a very mild description of what leprosy is, but aside from what's mentioned in our chapter, leprosy is mentioned actually several times in the Word of God, and it's described as being a grotesque and an incurable disease of the flesh. It was a plague of disgusting proportions, and in fact, it is still in existence today. Most of you probably know that. We call it Hansen's disease today, but there is the, the, the scourge of leprosy, the plague of leprosy still exists. There's still in some third world countries even leper colonies. And so I don't advise you to do an image search on your computer, but I would say this, that, that it's, it's, it's just as ugly as it's presented in the Word of God. It's just as grotesque as it is presented in the Word of God. Though there is, through antibiotics now in our day, a, it is a curable affliction. There was not in the days of the Old Testament or rather for, for, for the New Testament as well. Now in our scripture we can find several accounts of people being afflicted with this dreaded disease. Leprosy had different stages of severity uh, but was a progressive, that's important to remember, it was a progressive disease that ultimately affected the skin, affected mucous membranes and the nerves. It would begin by affecting the nerves of the individual causing places of numbness particularly on the hands which would many times a, a one who was afflicted with uh, numbness or with leprosy the first telling sign that they had it is their hands would go numb and they would notice it simply by seeing burns perhaps they'd grab a hot pot or they would have a laceration on their hand and they wouldn't know it until they had maybe one two or three of them because their hands were numb this was a sign that they were afflicted with the disease of leprosy it would cause tears cuts and lacerations the, the disease would then afflict upon its victim skin ulcers and open sores it would even cause the eyes of the sufferer to bleed. Eventually the smaller extremities of the leper, for example his fingers, his toes, eventually his hands and his feet, even his nose and his ears uh, would actually rot and fall off. And so it was a very dreaded, dreaded disease. Uh, from WebMD says this, leprosy is an infectious disease that causes severe disfiguring skin sores and nerve damage in the arms, legs and skin areas around the body. Leprosy primarily affects the skin and the nerves outside the brain and spinal cord called the peripheral nerve. Nerves. It may also strike the eyes and the thin tissue lining the inside of the nose. The main symptom of leprosy is disfiguring skin sores, lumps or bumps that do not go away after several weeks or months. The skin sores are pale colored. Leprosy was also a contagious disease. Um, therefore, those who suffered with it were alienated from society. I'm just giving you some context here. I, I do apologize. I see some of you covering your mouth like that. I, I'm, not, I'm not doing it to be gross, honestly. I, I want to give you context here. Um, but most, uh, uh, those who suffered with it would be alienated from society. They would be placed in a, sort of a concentration camp, to be honest. And um, most cases would ultimately kill the poor soul who was afflicted, but only after many, many years of suffering with the disease. And so they would end up dying in their old age. And so there was no cure for leprosy. It was a dreaded affliction. Now it's important to note that there exists a little bit of controversy in this chapter. Let me point it out and squash it real quick. Um, concerning the diagnosis of the disease of leprosy. Some higher critics of the Word of God would state that this actually is not indicative of leprosy here and that really what is being described is more of a mild uh, affliction such as eczema or psoriasis. Um, but that's just not true because we know what the Word of God says. We know what that word means. What is actually in view, and this is important that we remember, what is actually in view are the first minor symptoms of the disease that are being identified here in Leviticus chapter 13. And we're going to see why that's important here in a moment because there is a period of quarantine involved in order that there be no misdiagnosis, in order for someone who really didn't have the disease to be sent off to a leper colony and then become infected. So they were very careful. God was instructing Moses and the priests to be very careful to identify this, this plague at the onset 
before any further um, damage was done, okay? It's a very important fact to remember, and we're given the diagnosis at the very beginning stages of the disease. Now, in this chapter, we see that once it was determined that the individual bore significant evidence that the, that the disease of leprosy, leprosy may be present, they were to be declared unclean, and they were to be quarantined for a period of seven days, okay? To be quarantined means to be set apart, okay? It means to be placed uh, in a spot away from anybody else. So, for a period of seven days, this person was to be quarantined. After the seven days were accomplished, the priest would then take the subject and re-examine the patient and then shut him up for a, another period of seven days. After a period of a total of 14 days, if the blemishes on the patient's skin did not spread or whiten as the disease of leprosy, then the patient was declared clean. That means he either was healed of it or either he didn't have it in the first place that it was just scabs or sores that came from something else. He was then to wash himself and re-enter the congregation. If, however, the patient after 14 days of separation bore signs that the disease had progressed, then the priest would issue his ultimate judgment and declare the patient to be unclean. So that's essentially what you have going on here in this chapter. Something else of importance to remember is this, that the high priest or the priest was the only agent authorized to make the diagnosis. They were to go to the priest or the high priest, which it's interesting that God did not appoint physicians, right? It's interesting that He didn't appoint physicians to make this determination, but He called the priests to discern whether they be clean or they be unclean. Further on in our chapter, God then provides Moses with more instruction in identifying the disease by more symptoms that we're not going to get into uh, d uh, much of this morning, um, except to say that the priest was given authority to also make the decision if he saw fit to forget, forego the grace period altogether if the disease were already advanced, and then he would send the leper directly away. Okay, so you see what we've got here. We've got the beginning stages of leprosy. They would go to the priest. He would make a decision to quarantine them for seven days. He would come back in seven days to see if it had spread or if it bore more signs. And then he would come back another seven after another seven days and make a determination whether to declare them to be clean or whether to declare them to be unclean. However, and we see this in our chapter, if perhaps a subject came to him who had more advanced symptoms of the disease and the priest could discern right away that this is surely leprosy, they would forego the quarantine process altogether and send them straightway out of the camp immediately. Okay, so that's what's going on. So let's look at two things before we get into the application. We see the diagnosis. Let's look at the leper's isolation and then his condemnation, alienation, and desolation from which there is no consolation. Now, after the 14-day grace period, if the priest was sure that the individual bore the disease, the individual was put away outside the camp in a colony of other lepers. And this is important to remember. Uh, he was to never engage the people of God or in tabernacle worship again. He was cut off. And he was cut off even from his own family. It's, it's very wise for us to... If we can at all, and, and I know some of us, like, if you're like me, you don't have much of an imagination. I don't know, that, that disappeared sometime in my teens. But I used to have a very good imagination when I was a child, but I don't anymore. And so I struggle with this, but I try to, try to place myself within the times. I, I try to place myself thousands of years ago in the camp of the Israelites to, to, and understand that these were real people. Okay, these are not just stories of, of people that didn't really have emotions and, and they were uh, cold, indifferent people or, or something of the animal kingdom. These were real people with real emotions. And so when I think of what's going on here, I try to place myself in that situation. What if that were today? I try to put my heart where their heart is. Try to put my mind where their mind is. And, and understand this, that, that he was to be, if left unclean, he was to be permanently discharged from the camp of Israel, never to see his family again, never to see his brothers and sisters in Christ again, never allowed to enter into the gates of the courtyard of the tabernacle and engage in, in, in holy worship unto the Lord. 
And that's a very sad conclusion for the leper, right? But at the same time, leprosy was a contagious disease. We see this uh, in this chapter also, verses 47 through 59, that even the clothing of the afflicted and, and his fabric was to be tested by the priest to see if it had disease in it. And if it was found to carry the disease, it was to be burned. It was very important that the disease did not spread any further, lest it defile the whole camp of the Israelites. So let us see, even before the spiritual application is made, that God was looking out for the well-being of His people as a whole. And though it seems like a harsh penalty, and that does, it seems like a harsh penalty, does it not? That this poor soul who's afflicted, he's cut off from everyone else, though it's a harsh penalty, it would be much more harsh to allow it to go unchecked or unnoticed, as it would do more damage to others, as it would spread to others. So it was, a, it was a judgment out of compassion for those around him. It, it was to protect others from this dreaded disease. So we see his isolation. Let us also see his condemnation, alienation, and desolation. Again, as we said a moment ago, the plague of leprosy was progressive. At the time, there was no cure for it. It only got worse and worse. And it was only by the gracious hand of God that any could be spared of it. And though in our text we see mild symptoms of it, toward the end of the afflicted's life, the individual would find himself swollen, covered in oozing sores, losing his eyesight, losing feeling in parts of his body because of permanent nerve damage, and even suffer with the agony of having his extremities rot and fall off. This disease did not take the life of the individual immediately, but the individual would often suffer with it his whole life, only to succumb to it in his old age only to succumb to it in his old age. Eventually, the disease, the afflicted, would die outside of the camp, having never seen his family again. Having never, after being diagnosed, after being diagnosed, that, that fateful day when he would enter into the presence of the priest, perhaps he was in a conversation with his best friend there, having coffee or, or just enjoying the morning, walking out, and his friend says, oh, what's that on your head there? Or what's that on your arm? Hey, you need to go see the priest about that. Him knowing full well, man, I don't want to stand in front of that priest. And, and he does against his own judgment, but, 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 but desirous to know the truth, he walks into the presence of the priest and he, he says, look, I've got this sore, I, I've got this white spot, I need you to make a determination. And when the priest examined that and looked at it and said, unclean, Isolation, quarantine. Think of how that tore his, it would tear his heart apart. Think about only just his prayers just, just for, for a solid seven days. Just, Lord, let this not be leprosy. But then after the second seven days, he's just on pins and needles awaiting the judgment of the priest only for the priest to look at his skin further and say, no, utterly unclean. Think about the, the, the moment he heard those words knowing that, that, that he would never hug his wife again. He would never embrace his children again. He would never be able to enjoy their presence. He would never be able to see them grow. He would never be able to give his wife one more kiss. But he was forever to be alienated, to be condemned to a place of isolation without the camp. And even worse, would never even be able to enter the tabernacle to worship his God. Now these are not just made up stories of a bygone age, beloved, but they are real people who suffered this. He would be from a distance perhaps able to hear the festivities of the feast days, maybe even faintly hear the voice of one of his children laughing and playing, yet go to his death alone and alienated. The leper's conclusion is a sad one. That's why I said there's not much we really need to say here. The leper's conclusion was a sad one. And perhaps the physical pain and the agony was more bearable than the agony of hearing the words of the priest on that fateful day of his judgment unclean. Knowing that he would forever be separated from his God, the people of God, and his loving family. And so I ask you this morning, imagine, if you will, such a judgment. And let's go a bit further and imagine the pain of those whom he would leave behind. You see, it wasn't only his pain. Oh, the disease of leprosy was not just a painful one to the afflicted. What if it were your wife or your husband? What if after an enjoyable and restful Sabbath you woke as usual, 
to the first day of the week, to the sound of your children playing in the yard. As you go to set out on your day, you take a deep breath inhaling the morning air and you're just ready to start the day and your wife brings your breakfast to you and give you a goodbye kiss and as you lean in to give her a kiss on the cheek, you notice a spot. And you know what that spot means. Man, I'll tell you, it's hard to separate yourself from this. And you know that my life will never be the same. That there's judgment here in the camp. And that something must be done. And I best not, for the sake of my children, lay my lips to her, her own and send her to the priest right away so that he can make the judgment. Friend, this is a dreadful judgment. Perhaps you walk out to say goodbye to your son or daughter and you rub their head as I always do my children. And I notice some scabs or sores there on the top of the head. And I look at my hands and maybe a little bit of blood there. Knowing what it means and knowing that it's my child that I may never see again. Friends, I'm not trying to pull at your heartstrings this morning. I'm really not. But sometimes maybe that's what it takes in order to move some of us. To see the reality here. Emotion is not a bad thing. Sometimes we button up our suit jackets and tighten our ties so tight and act like we're a bunch of robots and fatalists that say whatever will be, will be. These are real people. And as I study this, maybe it's perhaps I couldn't get beyond this dreaded aspect of it. Perhaps maybe my judgment was clouded. But I saw myself and my own family in this situation. Oh, this dreaded disease. That was the facts of it. Now let's look at the important application. Now in the Word of God, leprosy has always been a type or an emblem, rather, of sin. Leprosy depicts the characteristics of it. It depicts its progressive and destructive nature. Isaiah describes characteristics of leprosy when he reveals the sin of the people. In Isaiah 1, 4 through 6, he says, An awe sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They are gone away backward. Why should ye be stricken any more? Ye will revolt more and more. Notice what he says. He says, The whole head is sick, the whole heart faint. From the sole of the foot, even under the head, there is no soundness in it, but what? But wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. We see some similar affliction there as he's drawn a parallel to what sin looks like in the eyes of God. And that's what we need to see here. It, it is no small subject of which we are discussing here. This is not something that needs to be shoved away or not mentioned because of its disgusting characteristics. When we imagine the horrendous picture in our heads of what this leprosy does, imagine yourself looking that way in the sight of God. Sin is a disgust to Him. God has used leprosy as a means of judgment against those who have done wickedly. Remember Miriam and Aaron? When they questioned the authority of Moses, what did God do? He pronounced judgment upon Miriam by stricking her, uh, smiting her with leprosy. By His gracious hand, He removed it. But she learned her lesson. Remember Gehazi, the irreverent, selfish servant of Elisha? After Naaman had been washed in the Jordan seven times and he was cleansed of his leprosy, he wanted to repay Elisha. Elisha said, no, 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 not necessary. He went on his way and old Gehazi chased after him and said, Elisha changed his mind. We will take that reward. Oh, God judged him. What did he do? He took Naaman's leprosy and he put it on him. Remember King Uzziah. When he usurped his role as king and he tried to intrude on the role of the priest, what happened to him? God judged him. He afflicted him with leprosy. So we see the parallels here. Leprosy is a type of God's judgment. It's a type of sin. Now let's look to, to some of it. Let's just look at two of its characteristics and see the parallels. Two of the characteristics that we see here. First of all, consider its seemingly harmless beginnings. Now, in Leviticus chapter 13, you see spots, sores, you see scabs, you see whiteness of the flesh and the hair. But you don't see the other things I'm talking about. Why? Well, because he's identifying the first marks of it. 
it doesn't need to go past the stage for him to know what it is, right? And so, consider its seemingly harmless beginnings. One did not awake one day in a pool of pus and blood from their bursting boils and rotting flesh. No. He may have just awakened to a small blemish or speck. Much like we would possibly awaken to a morning pimple or a patch of dry skin. No problem. I'll just get me some pumice stone and a moisturizer and take care of that. I've never used a pumice stone a day in my life. <laughs> I don't know what it is. Is it that bar that I never use in our shower? No, that's soap. <laughs> But perhaps that's how you view it. It's just a small speck, a small blemish. But that wasn't the case with leprosy, you see. If it remained a nearly unnoticeable blemish, it would have been okay, but leprosy didn't stay that way. Over time, it would turn its victim into a walking monstrosity. Friends, this is the diagnosis of sin. This is why it's, this is a, an important matter to discuss because though it may seem to reveal itself in the smallest unnoticeable ways, left alone, left undealt with, it evolves into something truly gruesome. Song of Solomon says in 2.15, Take us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines, for our vines have tender grapes. And we can draw the parallel sin left unchecked. One little fox. Uh, you look at it, the, the vineyard of, of a husbandman, a, a man like, Song, uh, like Solomon who had acres and acres of vineyards. What, what was one little fox to the vineyards of Solomon? But over time, if you don't catch that fox, little by little, him nibbling those vines begins to rot the vineyard. And before you know it, it's nothing but corroded, corrupted, decaying garbage. Friends, understand that one small blemish was no less a part of the disease of leprosy than the horror, horror that was to come. Let us see clearly that though there may be something that is seemingly harmless in your life or small, it is no less sin. And this is the practical application that we need to all look and examine our lives and see what's in our lives. Now, man, well, that's not a big deal. That's something small. That's, that's something left unconfessed. You know what it'll do to you? All sin is defilement. All sin is the seed that causes what we see in later chapters of the Word of God that depict the, the awfulness of such a, an affliction. Humble beginnings sin has in our lives, right? Consider the child. Tells the little lies. The child who is just a little bit disrespectful, or you see their carnal nature coming out in them, and I'm as bad as anybody, and you laugh at it. It's cute. Hey, it's sin. It's exposing the uncleanness within them. Second, note the contagious nature of leprosy. They were to be put away. Their clothes were to be burned. Why? Well, because they didn't want to infect anybody else. And let's parallel that with sin. Now, from one standpoint, we see the contagious nature of sin in that it has passed down from generation to generation simply because of the inerrant sin nature of the human condition that, Adam, uh, uh, that we were all born with in Adam. But from another angle, we, we see that a little leaven can leaven, a, can leaven the whole lump. Those who are steeped in sin, those who are walking in ungodliness, friends, are to be avoided by God's people. We see that there is to be a separation between God's people and, and, and sin. And this, beloved, it's a continual and overarching principle of Scripture that God's people walk not with the ungodly. There is to be a separation there is to be a division, and we've been studying this principle throughout our series as it is crystal clear, yet it seems to be one of the most rebelled against, perhaps more than most scriptural principles, in our day and age. Our intimate relationships are not to be with those of the world. There is to be a difference 
There's to be a distinction. And that is exactly what Paul says when he says, Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. What fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? Well, what is an infidel? It's not just a word that the Muslim uses. It, it means an unbeliever. So what part do you have? And he's drawing, listen, he, this is a serious matter. Because he's drawing a parallel between Christ and Satan. Light and darkness. And then the believer with the unbeliever. Yet some of us aren't taking that seriously. Hey, this is a big deal in Scripture. And there's to be a separation between you and the world. There's to be a difference between you and the world. When, when those who are affected by sin to the degree that they were in a reprobate condition, they were sent off away from the camp so not to infect others. This cannot be missed, dear soul. Oh, how many a Christian has fallen because they have began to fraternize with sin and sinners. You say, well, I'm to be a witness to them. Yes, you are. But I can name you names of those that began to fraternize with the wicked under the guise of being a witness who weren't a very good witness. That never works. Don't let your children tell you that either. Man. Don't let them tell you that. Stop it. There's to be a difference. We are a sanctified people. Friends, God is teaching His people to be holy, to be sanctified. And that's who we are as His people. And it's not His desire that we should take place ourselves in the face of defilement. It is a risk that we cannot afford to take. It is a risk that we certainly should not allow our children to take. Leprosy turned what was seemingly innocent into a hideous monster. And that's what sin does. Just look at, at, as, it, as it took Adam from innocency to alienation. So is its purpose in all men. In the end, its victims are cast out. Its victims are forever declared to be unclean. Separated from all that they love. Most of all, separated from God Himself to forever wallow in pain, agony, and heartbreak along with other lepers. That is the alienation of leprosy. Now let us look finally at the condemnation and desolation. And again, this is why this particular message doesn't need to be very long and doesn't require a whole lot of exegesis because it is a simple truth that needs to be understood plainly. And that is this, that sin will ultimately destroy you and its ramifications are permanent. Amen. Consider the leper who at the priest's judgment heard those terrible words unclean and then knew his fate. Notice particularly in verse number 44 where it is said he is utterly unclean. This means that there is not a shadow of hope or consolation to be offered. And such is total depravity. It is uncleanness to the uttermost. And I ask you to please make this consideration today that indeed it is true one day you will stand before the high priest and he is going to make his judgment. He is going to examine you. You say, oh, but it's just a small blemish. Overall, I have not succumbed to it. All it took for the priest to declare one unclean and to cast out was the smallest of blemishes. You see, the judgment was not made according to the stage of the disease. It was made by the smallest of evidence. You may ask, oh, but what about the seven days of isolation? What about the period of grace? Where do you think you are right now? It's a good question. Where do you think you are right now? One, one day, the 14 days are going to be over. Amen. One day, this period of isolation is going to be over. And the priest is going to make his final assessment. The difference is that once this time is completed, there's only one diagnosis that only one priest will make. You won't make it yourself. Think of the leper who, as we mentioned, would be heartbroken at the sound of the revelries in the camp, the joy of tabernacle worship, and the thought of his own family 
Think of his longing, his envy, that he would do anything, anything to be a part of it all. To hold his children, to kiss his wife, to bow and worship God. Yet his condition was permanent. You say again, brother, you're just pulling at our heartstrings. No, turn over to Luke chapter 16. And if you, you would accuse me of that, accuse the, uh, don't dare accuse the Holy Spirit of doing the same thing. Luke chapter 16, let's look at verse number 19. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at the gate full of sores. That's interesting. And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, moreover the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man he also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments. And notice this, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Afar off. But he saw him. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot. Stop right there for a moment. Do you, do you, do you think that the, the loving wife and the children just forgot about old dad when he went to the colony? Do you, do you think the children who have grown up and lived in rebellion and passed on, do you, do you think that the parents would not, if they could, reach down into the pits of hell and drag them out? But there's a gulf, and, 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 and as soon as the child may think, i got to go get, i got to go see Dad, that's when the priest would step in and say, no. There's separation. You can't do it. You can't go. But then Lazarus goes on, or the rich man goes on, and, and, and he says, well, well, at least, at least warn my brethren. At least send, uh, send Abraham to, to go tell my brethren, lest they also be tormented. And he says, no. You see, once the judgment was made, it was over. And those that would go could not, and those that would leave could not. And friends, this is the desolation. This is the calamity of the final judgment. To know that you will never, you will never have another opportunity. The rich man looked and he saw how Lazarus was comforted. Imagine the, the, the revelries of hearing the, the joy in the camp, but you couldn't go. Sin, sin is a serious thing, folks. Amen. And this is, this is where you will be in eternity, except for the cleansing hand of Christ. Amen. And we'll get into more of these details, I think, next week when we're going to deal in detail with the cleansing of it. Because there is a cleansing here. There's a cleansing of a leper in the next chapter. But I wanted to focus this morning upon the judgment of the leper and leave these things for your personal consideration. But we need to note that though there is one heavenly priest with power and authority to pronounce judgment upon those defiled by sin... This same priest also has the power and authority to cleanse the defilement of sin. In fact, while he was on earth, he proved this authority and power. Did he not? Mark chapter 1, verses 40 through 42. There came a leper unto him, beseeching him, and kneeling down to him, and saying unto him, If thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus, moved with compassion, put forth his hand and touched him, and saith unto him, I will be thou clean. And as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy departed from him, and he was cleansed. You see, during this period that you have now, you have opportunity to, cl to cling to this priest. Amen. To cling to him for a cleansing. So that one day after the judgment is made, you will not have the defilement of this leprosy against you. And again, while we're going into great detail next week concerning this cleansing... I believe I would do a great disservice to the offspring whom I'm called to allow any to leave here today having heard no message of the hope that there is in cleansing.
Christ Jesus is the high priest who is righteous in both His judgment and His mercy, who because of the purity of His own nature took the defilement of our own, who because of His own cleanness is able to cleanse that incurable disease of sin, who by His own blood may wash the leprosy from our infected being and bring us out of that place of alienation back into fellowship with God and His people. Amen. You see, right now, the sinner is in a state of isolation and alienation. But one day, that isolation and alienation will turn into condemnation and desolation. Right. Amen. Isolation and alienation, there's that quarantine. There's, there's, you can get out of it. You can be cleansed by the blood of Christ. But one day, there will be no more cleansing available. And you will be left desolate. I pray that the Lord will use this message in some fashion, in some way. If you're lost here today, I understand that, that, that what I've mentioned in the, the gruesome descriptions that I've given pale in comparison to what awaits the sinner who dies in his sin. And the glory that I could describe would pale in comparison to the glory that awaits those who are cleansed of their sin. If you're saved, let me, let me say this. If you're a child of God, no, no, while you will never be alienated again from God, sin is a disgusting thing. Sin is a revolting thing. Amen. Sin can still defile you. Sin can ruin your life. Best stay away from it. Amen. And best stay away from those who from head to toe are afflicted by it. Father, we thank you for allowing us.